So, hello everyone, welcome. I'm David Bailey, I'm the host for the colloquium uh, today. And before we get started, I'll like to remind everyone that you can post your questions in the Q&A and then we'll have lots of time for discussion at the end. Anyways, we're very excited today to welcome Harry Cliff to give our final colloquium of the year. And Harry's a particle physicist at the University of Cambridge, where he also received his BA, MSci, and PhD. And from 2012 to 2018, along with his position at Cambridge, he was the first fellow of modern science at the Science Museum in London, where he curated two major exhibitions, Collider in 2013 and, and The Sun in 2018. You know, his TED talk on how we reached the end of physics and his Beyond the Higgs talk at the Royal Institute have together more than 3 million views on YouTube. And his first popular science book, How to Make an Apple Pie from Scratch, will be published in August. And I checked, and you can already pre order it on Amazon. So, Harry's talk today is on LHCB at CERN, the LHCB experiment at CERN. And it's very timely since just last week, the science news and blogs and Twitter were all abuzz with LHCB's announcement of hints of physics beyond the standard model. So, I'm sure you'll all join me virtually in welcoming Harry to give his talk on Rare Beauty Are We Seeing Signs of New Physics at the LHC? So go ahead, Harry. Well, thanks, David. Thanks for a very kind introduction. Thanks for having me. Thanks for also giving my book a plug. I didn't expect that. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, my sort of area of research on LHCB, which is in the rare uh, decays of uh, beauty quarks. And, and it's particularly well timed because, as David said, just last week we had some kind of exciting or cautiously exciting news uh, come out of the experiment. So the official line from LHCB and from CERN was that we were cautiously excited about these results, not overexcited. So this got, I don't know if you saw any of this coverage, but the, the story was quite widely covered in the in the UK press, at least. You can see some of the headlines from various uh, newspapers and online websites and things. So, you know, has the, has the Large Hadron Collider finally challenged the laws of physics? Well, that's sort of what I'm going to be mostly talking to you about today. And I'll go through and, and explain a bit what we've we've seen uh, and what it might mean, uh, uh, you know, for the sort of for the next few years in high energy physics. So, so just to begin, um, I work on this experiment. This is LHCB, uh, which is a large particle physics experiment. It's um, buried about 100 meters underground, just next to the uh, the runway of Geneva Airport uh, in, in on the board, just on the very border between France and Switzerland. It's actually in France, just over the French. Uh, and it's one of the four large uh, detectors on the Large Hadron Collider, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, which is the, the biggest scientific instrument in the world, 27 kilometer circumference particle accelerator uh, hosted at CERN uh, in Switzerland well, and in France. Uh, and you can see here a, a shot of the area uh, where the LHC is hosted. So in the distance there, you can see the Alps and that the big peak in the, in the middle, that's Mont Blanc. Um, the highest mountain in Europe, you've got uh, Lac Le Mans or Lake Geneva here, the sort of greyish smudge is the city of Geneva, and then here you can see the root of the LHC. So there are four large experiments on the LHC, Atlas, Alice, CMS and LHCB, this is LHCB over here, and then you can see the airport runway. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, but it's worth saying. So what the LHC does basically is it takes, uh, somewhere over here at CERN, there's an ordinary bottle of industrial hydrogen gas, hydrogen extracted, it's ionized, and protons are sent off through a series of accelerators at CERN, eventually into the LHC, and they're accelerated um, to uh, currently uh, the highest energy they've reached is 6.5 tera electron volts per beam. So that's where the proton is carrying, you know, of order 7,000 times its rest mass energy. And then they're collided into each other at these four points, and the detectors have to record what happens, what new particles emerge from those collisions. So, um, the, the LHC was primarily built to test, well, to complete and test what we call the standard model of particle physics. So our current best description of the fundamental particles that make up the universe, the forces through which they interact. And this is a, a model that you could argue sort of began being assembled more than 100 years ago, 124 years ago in 1997, using uh, this small glass tube you can see in the middle. So this is a cathode ray tube used by uh, Joseph John Thompson, who was the director of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, where I am I'm based. Uh, and he used this very tiny apparatus to discover the first elementary particle, or as far as we know, elementary particle, which is the electron. And so this is really the beginning of uh, the subject of particle physics, uh, you could argue. And you might also say, well, the standard model, the story of the standard model ended, uh, I said, more than a century later on the 4th of July. 2012 Higgs Dependence Day, as it's sometimes referred to at CERN, which was the day that the LHC experiments, Atlas and CMS, announced the discovery of the Higgs boson, which was the last 
particle in the standard model to be found had been predicted uh, almost 50 years earlier in 1964 by Higgs and Anglaire and Brout and, and various others uh, to explain how the fundamental particles uh, in the universe acquire mass. So between these two particles, you had a lot of discoveries and, and they kind of uh, grouped together in this theory called the standard model. So the standard model, it's a, it's a quantum field theory. So it's based on the idea that the, the basic ingredients of the universe are quantum fields, which are these sort of invisible uh, objects that fill the whole universe. And we have each, we have a field for each of the elementary particles and each elementary particle is thought of as a little quantized ripple vibration in these underlying quantum fields. So the, the standard model contains three forces, the electromagnetic force, the weak and the strong forces. Uh, there are six quarks and six leptons, and they have the, the mass of these particles, or at least the ones that have mass in this model, acquire their mass th through uh, this process called spontaneous symmetry breaking, which uh, involves, uh, which ends up producing this extra particle called the Higgs boson. I'll talk a, a little bit more about that. Um, but the thing to say about the standard model, it's, it's stupendously successful. It describes basically everything we know about the matter that we can see in the universe around us. And, it, you know, in terms of the structure of atoms, the basic components of atoms, the forces that act between electrons and the nucleus and within the nucleus. And it's in agreement with more or less every particle physics experiment we've done. Um, and to give you an example of how powerful this, this theory is, it can make really dazzlingly precise pr predictions. So one very famous quantity the standard model uh, can be used to predict is the anomalous magnetic dipole moment of the electron. So essentially that the magnetic field of the electron in some sense. And you, you get a number that you can predict from theory to something like 10 significant figures, which you can see at the bottom there with a very small uncertainty. And then if you do a very sophisticated experiment, you can also measure this quantity extremely accurately. And you find these things agree with each other to about one part in a billion, one part in 10 billion. So it's, it's a fantastic successful theory, but of course we know that it's not a complete description of nature. For, for one thing, gravitation is not included in this model famously, but there are many other reasons for thinking there's more to discover. I mean, uh, probably the most famous is the existence of dark matter. So this is a photograph, uh, I think of the Abel cluster, large cluster of galaxies. And you can see in this image, hopefully, these kind of uh, smears in the in the image, and this is the effect of gravitational lensing. So the effect of a large amount of mass in the cluster warping light as it travels past the cluster and creating this lensing effect. And, and you can use this lensing to infer the amount of uh, material in this image, and you find that there's far more uh, gravitating matter than you can see with your telescopes. And this is the, that that dark matter is shown in this uh, sort of colourful haze. And of course, when we know from many different sorts of measurements involving the cosmic microwave background, galaxy rotation, uh, uh, gravitational lensing, and so on, that the composition of the universe is about 95% unknown. So the standard model only describes about 5% of the total energy content of the universe, and then the other 95% is dark matter and dark energy, for which the standard model has very little to say. So the, that's probably the most compelling reason for thinking there's some new fundamental objects to be found beyond what we already know. There's other problems, of course, famously one to do with matter and antimatter. And in the standard model, every matter particle, so the six quarks and the six leptons, these things in blue, which include the electron, uh, all have uh, antimatter partners, which have identical masses, but opposite charges. And every process uh, that we know about, well, it's not quite true, but um, every process we've observed so far in the standard model always creates equal amounts of matter and antimatter, which means that in the early universe, if you sort of use the standard model to try and understand the early, very, very early period of the Big Bang in the first trillionth of a second, you would expect equal amounts of matter and antimatter to have been created and therefore to have then annihilated each other and left us with a universe with nothing in it. So the fact that there is material in the universe, again, is a challenge to the standard model and it requires physics beyond the standard model to address this, this problem. So we've got these observational challenges, dark matter and matter-antimatter asymmetry, uh, to just name a couple. And then there are a bunch of other open questions. So, uh, you know, we now know, of course, from neutrino oscillations that neutrinos have masses, but we don't know how they get their masses. That's not uh, yet understood. There's a mystery as to why the standard model has what we call the flavor structure that it does. So why are the three generations, six quarks and six leptons? We don't really know the answer to that. 
Um, why are there three fundamental forces in the standard model? The electromagnetic weak and strong forces, which are, got, which are generated by these three gauge symmetries, or we don't know the answer to that either. Uh, do the forces all unify at high energy? Again, not sure. Uh, where does gravity fit into this picture? So there's lots we, we don't know. And this is, you know, many of these uh, questions motivated uh, the, the LHC in the beginning. But I suppose the, the, the reason, perhaps the strongest reason, perhaps, that we expected new physics at the Large Hadron Collider is something called the hierarchy problem, um, which I'll talk about a little bit just, uh, just briefly. So the hierarchy problem is to do uh, with the Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson is uh, the quantized excitation of an underlying field that is everywhere in the universe known as the Higgs field. So this is a, a scalar field, a spin zero field. And it's through the interaction with this field that the other elementary particles acquire their mass. So the mass of the electron, the quarks, uh, and the muon and the tau come from their interaction with this Higgs field. And um, the Higgs field is unlike all the other fields in the standard model in that it has a uniform non-zero value in the vacuum. So even when there are no Higgs bosons around, the field has a non-zero value, which is, which is not true for the other quantum fields apart from small quantum effects. So you have this Higgs potential, uh, which you can see Peter Higgs writing down here, which famously takes the form of a, a Mexican hat. So sorry, apologies to Peter Higgs for this, this graphic. But um, basically the idea is in the, in the early universe, the Higgs field undergoes a, a phase transition where it goes from having a zero uh, value everywhere, and then it rolls down this slope into the valley of this potential where it acquires a non-zero vacuum expectation value. And it's that vacuum expectation value that generates the mass of the elementary particles. Now, the problem with, well, the thing that's not understood about this mechanism is that if you try to calculate the vac what the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field ought to be based on our understanding of particle physics, then you get one of two scenarios, one of which is that the two natural options are that the Higgs field has a VEV up at the Planck scale, so an enormous value. Um, and that would be very bad because if it had a vacuum expectation value of the Planck scale, then elementary particles would be so massive that everything would collapse into a black hole and you wouldn't have a, a universe with structure in it. The, alter the other alternative is that the, the, the expectation value of the Higgs is zero. And in that situation, you end up with a universe where particles have no mass and atoms can't form. And again, you don't have structure. And what we observe, what we know from the, the mass of uh, the W boson, one of the weak force particles, is that the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs is actually 246 GeV, which is not the Planck scale and it's not zero. It's this strange uh, sort of what looks like a finely tuned number that's just about in the right place to allow interesting things to happen in the universe for atoms to form and, and so on. So this problem is known as the hierarchy problem, and it was the strong reason, strongest reason to expect new physics at the Large Hadron Collider. And the basic argument goes something like this, which is that the, the Higgs field interacts with the other quantum fields in the standard model. It was sort of represented by these little Feynman diagrams on, on the left with these loops. And these interactions have a tendency to drive uh, the, the mass of the Higgs boson to up, up to the Planck scale. And to avoid this, you either have to finely tune uh, the sort of parameters of your theory, but there are other ways of solving this problem. One of them was an idea, or is an idea called supersymmetry, where you introduce an additional superfield for every field in the standard model, and these superfields have the effect of cancelling out the the quantum uh, the quantum corrections from the ordinary standard model particles. And the, the end result of this is you get a Higgs field with a nice stable value uh, around the, what we observe in nature, and you don't need excessive fine tuning. And this argument, basically, for it to work, you expect to see some kind of new phenomena around the same energy as the Higgs boson. So that can either be supersymmetric particles, it could be extra dimensions of space. You might discover that the Higgs is actually not fundamental, that it's got internal components. But all of these you'd expect to show up at the energy of the Higgs boson, which is the energy that the LHC is designed to probe. And this is the reason why a lot of people expected to see new physics at the Large Hadron Collider when it turned on uh, just over a decade ago now. But if you've followed the sort of news in physics, you will know that over the last decade or so, um, all mo well, almost all of the sort of ideas that people had for new physics at the LHC have turned out not to, not to have been found so far at least. So 
is a bunch of headlines from the last decade, mostly about supersymmetry, which was the most popular extension of the standard model, and you know various results that challenged uh, supersymmetry and kind of made it. Look, it now seems that at least the versions of the supersymmetry that were imagined, the sort of simple versions at the start of the previous decade, are now very unlikely to to actually be the solution to, to these problems. And it's led some people even to challenge, you know, is to say things like, well, is particle physics facing an uncertain future after 10 years of, of not seeing any signs of new physics? So it's been an interesting time in the field, for sure. I think some people have maybe got a bit depressed. Other people are sort of optimistic. And, you know, the LHC obviously has a long time to run yet. But, but against all this sort of, uh, these are results that mostly have come from the big general purpose experiments at the LHC, ATLAS and CMS. But in, in the meantime, something interesting has been happening at LHCB, uh, which is the gradual appearance of a series of subtle deviations from what we would expect based on the standard model. And these, I think, if you talk to uh, phenomenologists, at least the, the phenomenologists that I know, these are the things that they're all pinning their hopes on now in terms of seeing some new physics, at least in, in the, the near term. So I'm now going to talk to you a little bit about what these anomalies are, uh, and, and particularly now the result as well that we, we had come out last week. So just to explain a little bit about what LHCB does. So in very broad terms, there are two ways of searching for new particles or new quantum fields at a collider, or indeed in general. Uh, one of them is a direct measurement. So this is essentially where, say, at the LHC, you have two particles with energy E, you collide them into each other, and you make a new particle or, or some new object. And that can have a mass up to 2E over C squared, so where you basically added up the energy in your beam collision, assuming you can get all the energy out of your collision. Um, and so you can, you can you directly produce this new particle. Uh, that new particle probably then decays, and you detect its decay products in your, in your detector. And you then see evidence for some new particle. And this is exactly how the, the Higgs boson was discovered back in 2012. Now, the advantage of this method is that if you create a new particle, it, you can quite quickly figure out what its properties are and get some information on it. The, the drawback is that you are limited in terms of the uh, kinds of part, the, the masses of the particles you can observe based on the energy of your collider. So you can only create particles that were within the energy reach of your collider experiment. So there's another way. Um, which is the, the broadly speaking the way the kind of measurements we do at LHCB, which are indirect measurements. So in, in general, it would be something like this. So you have some particle that will get created in your collision, and that particle will decay into some final state involving some different types of particles. And you will have a prediction from the standard model of how often this decay process should happen. And then you say, well, OK, let's imagine that there's some new quantum fields in nature. It could be supersymmetry. It could be something else. And if these exist, these can pro uh, basically provide you with an alternative route for this decay to happen. So you have your, you know, your standard model process, which would involve probably the weak force or some of the other forces in the standard model. Let's say there's a, you know, an extra force in nature. That extra force could subtly influence this decay and change its properties in a way that you could then measure if you make a precise measurement. Now, the sort of advantage of this method is that you don't have to be able to directly create the new physics particles. So the, the particles that are responsible for this kind of extra route between the initial state and the final state could, in principle, be very heavy. They, they could have masses way above the energy reach of your collider, but because of quantum effects, they can still have a measurable impact on the decay. So it's a little bit like you, what you end up seeing are kind of like the footprints of, of some animal. You, you can see the footprints these heavy particles are leaving on standard model processes. And that gives you a hint that there's something interesting out there to be discovered. Although just from these sorts of indirect measurements, it's not so easy to figure out exactly what's causing this effect. And for that, you then want to have a direct measurement where you try and create the, the new particles directly in an experiment. But it gives you a clue where to look and whether there is indeed something interesting out there to find. So that's broadly speaking how well HCB works. And in general, the particles that we're looking at in terms of the decaying, what we call, we tend to refer to as beauty quarks, but you are more usually refer to as bottom quarks, uh, which are the, the fifth heaviest quark, the, the third generation copy of the down quark that you find inside protons and neutrons. So. I'll just introduce you to LHCB. So LHCB, the experiment itself, it's if you're familiar with 
uh, Large Hadron Collider experiments, it's quite different to the others in terms of its design. So Atlas CMS uh, and Alice as well are what we call barrel shaped machines. They're basically shaped like a barrel and the collisions happen in the middle of the barrel and they, they kind of record everything that comes out from, from the collision. Now, LHCB is more like a kind of a pyramid on its side. And the reason it's this shape, it's kind of this cone shape is because the beauty quarks tend to be produced close to the beam line. So if you imagine there's a proton beam coming in from the left here, another one coming in from the right, the collision happens right at the edge of the experiment in something called the vertex locator, which is a silicon detector that sits very close to the beam line. And then the beauty quarks tend to fly close to the beam. So that's why the experiment has the shape it does. It's to sort of maximize its uh, ability to reconstruct these beauty quarks and their decays. So these beauty quarks will be produced in the collision. They'll fly maybe up to a centimeter before decaying, and then they decay into other particles. They then pass through a series of subdetectors. So this great big blue thing you can see in the middle of the image is a, is a, a magnet. Uh, and this uh, bends the trajectories of charged particles to allow you to measure the momentum. You then beyond that have uh, calorimeters, which are energy measuring instruments. So they absorb most particles like electrons and protons, other types of hadrons and measure their energies. And then beyond that, the very edge of the experiment, you have muon systems. So these are tracking detectors that record muons because muons basically make it all the way through the experiment out to the other side. So you have a series of layers of different sub detectors and they allow you to basically reconstruct the trajectories of the charged particles uh, as they go through the experiment. And the other thing that LHCB has, which is quite unique uh, compared at least to some other, so compared to say Atlas and CMS is we have these detectors called rich detectors, which are ring imaging Cherenkov detectors. And these are essentially used to identify different types of particles. They allow different species of particles apart from each other, different, particularly different types of hadrons, so different types of particles containing quarks. And you know, the core physics program of this experiment is to study beauty quarks and also charm quarks, uh, the sort of the other second, the second generation uptype quark uh, in, in large numbers and at high precision. So my particular area of research and, and the area that this results come out from is in the study of the very rarest decays of these beauty quarks. So I'm just going to explain briefly why rare decays are interesting. So to sort of introduce that, hopefully this is familiar, but um, in the standard model, there's only one force, uh, one particle that can change quark flavor, and that's the W boson. And because the W boson is charged, when it changes quark flavor, it either changes an uptype quark into a downtype quark or a downtype quark into an uptype quark. But there are, um, and only these transitions are allowed in the standard model at tree level. So this is, uh, you know, um, basically it means you go from a sort of a UC or T to a DS or B. And the intergenerational transitions are suppressed. So in general, uh, you know, a U and a D quark couple together more strongly than a U and an S quark, which is in a different generation, for example. Um, so that means that if you have a flavor changing neutral current interactions, this is where a, a quark changes its flavor, but stays, uh, but its charge remains the same. So for example, you might have a decay where a beauty quark transforms into a strange quark. The only way this can happen in the standard model is through some complicated loop process where involving multiple W bosons or gauge bosons and maybe a loop of top quarks or something. And because you have these complicated loop processes involved, it tends to suppress the decay um, and it makes them very rare. And by rare, I mean that for a, you know, for if you create a million of these beauty quarks, maybe one of them will decay in this kind of way. So we're talking about one in a million sort of level of events. So these are very rare as, as a result of this, but this means that if there say is a, a new force in nature that can actually change a B quark directly into a strange quark, which you would represent by this little Feynman graph over here, that even if the, the, the force field particle responsible for this process is very heavy, it can still have a measurable impact on the decay rate because the standard mod rate is so low. Um, so this actually gives you sort of sensitivity to particles which can have masses as high as a thousand tera electron volts. So that's, you know, two orders of magnitude heavier than the energy scale of the LHC. So in principle, this is a very powerful way of looking for signs of, of new particles and forces. Um, so these B anomalies that have been seen over the last few years, they, they generally involve a decay of this form, which is known, tend to be referred to as B to S L L decay. So this is basically where a beauty quark 
transforms into a strange quark and then emits two charged leptons. So these leptons could either be electrons and positrons or muon and antimuon. And um, you have this, this is a Feynman diagram representing this process in the standard model. So you've got uh, a B quark that then turns into an uptype quark, radiates a W, changes into a strange quark. You've even got a Z or a gamma. It's quite complicated. There's lots of particles involved and it has a very low rate around one in a million. But this process can be altered. Say, for example, if there's some exotic object, like something called a leptoquark, for example, and I'll talk a little bit more about these later on, these could interfere with the process and change the decay rate or change various properties of the decay in a way that you could that you could measure in your experiment, which is why these are, are interesting decays to, to study. So just to, just to introduce a little bit more about, about B physics. So when you create these, these beauty quarks are created in very large numbers at LHCb. So we get billions of them produced every year. And as soon as they're produced, they hadronize. So they meet up with other quarks or antiquarks and form bound states. And those states are either mesons, which are quark antiquark pairs, or baryons, which are triple quark uh, states. And here are the sort of these are the main uh, states that we see at LHCb. There's something called a B plus meson, which is an up anti bottom, a B zero, a down anti bottom, a BS which is a strange anti-bottom, and then a lambda B, which is a baryon with a, an up, a down, and a bottom quark inside. So these are the main species that we see in our, in our experiments. So we never actually see the B quark on its own. It's bound up inside one of these bound states. And these states have a wide range of different decays of these types, where you have a, a B quark going to a strange quark and two muons. So here's a list of the various different decay processes that we can study, for example. So there's B plus decays, B zero decays, BS, but they, they all essentially involve the same underlying physics process, which is a beauty quark changing into a strange quark and a muon anti-muon. And new physics effects can affect the branching fractions, i.e. how often these decays happen, and also the angular distribution. So you get in the final states, you generally have three or four particles produced and the angles they come flying out from the decay can also give you information about what uh, sort of underlying physics was going on in the decay process itself. So the measuring these quantities, comparing them to your prediction in the standard model, you can get information about, you know, new particles that could have in principle be affecting the decay. So um, I'll start with the, some of the history of these anomalies. So there's been some long standing deviations uh, in these processes from the standard model predictions in what we call the branching fractions. So that's just essentially how often does a given B particle decay into a particular final state. Um, and these branching fractions are generally measured as a function of what we call Q squared. And Q squared is just the invariant mass of the dimuon pair. So if you take the four vectors of these two muons and square them, uh, the sum, sum and square them, you get this, this value Q squared, which is effectively the mass of you know, these two particles combined. And I'm just going to show you a few graphs uh, to, to kind of get the point across. So what you can see on this graph here, this is a measurement from 2014 of uh, the decay B plus goes to K plus mu mu. So this is one of these B to SLL decays. And this is the branching fraction plotted as a function of Q squared, the dimuon mass. And you can see these bands here are the theory estimates from using the standard model and the data points are what we measure at LHCb. And what you notice is that in this low Q squared region from about zero to seven or eight, the data points all fall below the theory prediction. So there's a sort of, there are fewer of these decays happening in this particular regime than we would expect from, from the standard model. Um, this is another very similar measurement. This time it's looking at the, the neutral B meson decay, but this is again, very similar physics involved. And again, you see the branching fraction again at low Q squared, the data points are all below the theory predictions. And just to emphasize, these are completely independent data samples, different particles involved. So, but they're seeing the same effects in both channels. Here's another one again, this time involving the BS uh, meson. So that's the bottom anti-strange meson. And again, you see at low Q squared, the data points fall below the theory. Now you could say, okay, well, none of these data points, their errors are still quite large. They're not that far away from the theory. So these are sort of indicative and they're interesting, but you know, not wholly convincing on their own, perhaps that you're seeing something new. Um, another series of anomalies to do with the, or to do with the angular uh, distributions in these decays, particularly in this decay, which is B zero to K star zero mu mu decay. And in this process, the K star, which is a, an excited, strange meson, 
decays into a kaon and a pion. So you end up with four particles in the final state, the, the muon anti-muon pair and the k and the pi. And you can define a series of angles uh, in the rest frame of the B meson, uh, which have these, it doesn't really matter particularly, you have to understand all of this, but there's basically three angles you can use to parameterize the decay. And then you can write down um, uh, the what you expect the angular distribution to be uh, based on a series of uh, parameters that you can calculate from your theories. This is basically a long, complicated formula for the angular distribution of this decay. And I've circled in red, these are these, these quantities FL and the S quantities and this thing called AFB. These are observables that you can measure by fitting the angular distributions that you see in your experiment and comparing them to the standard model. And again, without going into a huge amount of detail, what you see when you, this is a, a much more recent measurement. This was from just the very beginning of last year uh, where they up, we updated the uh, measurement with more, with, with a, a good chunk of the uh, data from uh, the second run of the LHC. And again, you can see in these angular variables now, so this is not branching fractions, but these angular observables, again at low Q squared, at low dimuon mass, you see that the data points all fall some way away from your theoretical predictions. Um, in, in these are four different angular observables from the same decay and again they're all seeming to do agree with the standard model so these collectively form what we call the b anomalies these strange effects mostly at low q squared that, that where we're seeing these deviations um, and the tension in this particular analysis this angular analysis is a is tension to the standard model at about 3.3 sigma so that's 3.3 standard deviations from the theory prediction where, where you're sort of at a level where you would, if you did a thousand experiments of this type, you would only expect uh, one of them or so to fall this far away from theory just by random statistical fluke. Now, this is some way away from the the threshold, the slightly arbitrary threshold, but the sort of convention in, in particle physics is that you have to be five standard deviations from your theory before you can say that you've really observed something interesting. But the problem with these measurements is they 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 suffer from what we call well, from various theoretical uncertainties. So. As you saw in those previous plots, those theory predictions have errors, and a lot of that comes from very difficult to calculate hadronic effects, which is essentially to do with the fact that you don't actually look at a, a, a bare B quark, you're looking at the B quark bound up in some complicated meson with lots of you know, gluons and other things going on inside it, and calculating that is difficult. And so there's, there's all, you can always argue with these measurements, is are you really seeing a deviation or is it that we don't understand the hadronic effects properly? And that could explain the deviation. So this motivates looking for what we call theoretically clean observables, where you don't have these theory uncertainties. So that's what I'm now going to move on to. So, um, what the the anomaly that was uh, the measurement that was announced last week relates to one of these very theoretically experimentally clean observables, and, and these essentially are observables that compare two different but related processes. So one where you have a B quark that transforms into an S quark and a muon anti muon pair. And then another process uh, where instead of producing a muon and anti-muon, it produces an electron and an anti-electron. Now, in the standard model, um, the leptons, the electron, the muon, the tau, have identical couplings to the weak force, the electromagnetic force. So apart from effects due to their masses, you expect this process to occur equally as often. So the muon process to occur equally as often as the electron process. And you can define this ratio which is essentially the ratio of the branching fractions of the muon process divided by the electron process as a function of this q squared dimuon mass again. So the reason this is a great quantity is because because you take this ratio between the muon and the electron decay, these hadronic effects that are difficult to calculate basically cancel very, very precisely. And you can make a very precise prediction using the standard model that this ratio should be one. And you know, it, it's it, there's very little argument about this. It's in the standard model. It's almost it's definitely one. And if you see something that isn't one, well, that that could be the sign of of new physics. Um, the other advantage of doing this kind of measurement is a lot of the experimental uncertainties cancel in the ratio as well, as well as the theory uh, problems. So this is a very powerful test for new physics that could be non-flavor universal. In other words, new physics that treats muons and electrons differently which of course would be beyond the standard model. Um, so the first time one of these quantities was measured, uh, well, sorry, the, the most recent measurements from LHCb, apart from the one last week, uh, this quantity RK, which is for the B plus decay, was measured a couple of years ago. And it saw this, uh, it got this value of about 85% uh, 
with around about a 6% uncertainty. So you were sort of in the sort of two and a half sigma uh, level deviation from the standard model. And again, this is in this low Q squared region, the same way you, same place you saw these deviations for the branching fractions and the angular observables. There's another sort of longer standing measurement also, this time of the B naught process. And again, th these are in two different bins of the dimuon mass, but it, the, the take home message again is you see that this quantity R is not one, it's 0.66 in this case with a reasonably large uncertainty, but again, some distance away from, from one. So this, these, these two results have combined with the other measurements have created a lot of excitement and arguably it's the sort of hot topic in high energy physics at the moment. And so the update of the RK analysis, so this is this measurement here, which originally was only published with a fraction of the available data was really eagerly anticipated. Everyone was looking forward to the, the big winter conference Morion, which took place just um, last week. Uh, and usually everyone sort of spends a lot of their time, well, a mixture of time listening to physics talks and then skiing. But of course, this time there was no skiing. It was all, all online. But I think it's still a very interesting conference because of the results that came out. So I, I know that I think I'm, I'm getting a little uh, short on time, so I will speed up slightly. But um, just to give you a bit of idea of how these measurements are done. So what, what's done when you measure RK, you actually measure a double ratio compared to a control mode decay. So the control mode in this case is the B plus uh, meson decaying into a J psi, which is a charm anti-charm state and a K on. And then the J psi decays into an electron pair or a muon pair. And this control mode is useful because first of all, it has a much larger branching fraction. It's about thousand, one in a thousand instead of one in a million. So it's a thousand times more often than the rare mode. But also we know that the J psi decays to electrons and muons equally as often. So we, this is like a standard candle that we can use to, to check that our, uh, our sort of measurement is working properly. So in practice, what's actually measured is this double ratio where you measure the, the number of the uh, muon decays divided by the electron decays um, for the, the rare mode. And then you divide that by the same ratio, but this time using the control mode. And this has the effect of canceling a lot of your uncertainties uh, and you have to, obviously have taken the different efficiencies into account as well. But there's basically two bits of the analysis. One is where you you measure from your data how many of these decays you see um, and calculate this ratio. And then you have to figure out your efficiency. So how likely are you to reconstruct these different decays? And that's taken from, from simulation. So the advantage of this double ratio, as I said, is a lot of systematic effects cancel very precisely. And this makes it really robust against uh, hidden biases that you might have missed. So the basic way in terms of how you actually reconstruct these signals is you have your proton, proton collision. Uh, hopefully you get a B meson produced. This thing will then fly up to a centimeter or so. It has a lifetime of about 1.5 picoseconds and then it decays into your three particles, the K on and then the two leptons. And you search your data for basically trip, uh, three tracks of the right identity. You combine them to create your B candidate. And then you do various filtering processes to filter out the real signal from, from the background. Um, one of the challenges of these measurements is that electrons and muons leave very different signatures in the experiment. So um, a, a muon is highly penetrating. This is a little cross section of the LHCb experiment. The collisions happen over here. Here you've got the magnet and the various subsystems. Muons will fly from the collision point right out to the edge of the experiment. They'll leave signatures in the muon stations at the edge of the detector. Electrons, on the other hand, uh, are stopped in the calorimeter. Um, so they're absorbed by this thick, uh, heavy uh, part of the detector that measures their energy. So they have different signatures and therefore different efficiencies. And in fact, we're much better at reconstructing muons than electrons. And you have to correct for that in your measurement to make sure what you're seeing is actually caused by physics and not caused by the different efficiencies in your detector. Um, I'll probably skip over this because I think we're a little bit short on time. But um, the efficiency... You're, you're, so you're trying to measure this efficiency. So how good are you at reconstructing these different decay modes? And this is taken from simulation. And that simulation is then calibrated using the control mode decays that you have in data to improve the agreement between data and Monte Carlo. And what's done, one of the reasons that the team who did this are very confident in the measurement is they do this really stringent cross-check. They measure this quantity called RJ Psi, which is a single ratio of the branching fractions of the control modes with each other. Now, because this is a single ratio, it means that it doesn't benefit from all the nice cancellations that you get in the double ratio. So it, you have to really control your efficiencies to a much higher degree to get this uh, measurement right. The other thing, of course, that's useful is we know that RJ Psi 
must be equal to one because the jape size decays equally as often to muons and electrons. So we know this is equal to one and it doesn't because it doesn't benefit from these cancellations. If you measure it and you get one, that gives you a lot of confidence. And indeed, when this quantity is measured uh, in the analysis that was published last week, um, our jape psi comes out as very close to one within the within uncertainties. And this gives a lot of confidence that the efficiencies are well under control. Um, so this just shows you, these are the, uh, the uh, maximum likelihood fits that are used to extract the number of the two different, of the four different decay modes. So you have uh, the rare electron mode here in the top left, the rare muon mode in the top right. And you'll notice the muon signal is much stronger and that's because of this higher muon reconstruction efficiency. Um, so this big peak, that's the, that's the invariant mass of the, the B meson. In the electron, you can see that it's, it's, a, it's a messier distribution and that's because the electrons radiate photons as they pass through the detector and that tends to smear the mass resolution out and you also see there is larger background. So this is a more challenging, the electrons are more challenging to measure in general. And then you have the two control modes. So these are the jape psi modes, the electron one and the muon one. So you extract the four yields from these, these fits. Um, and then finally, RK is measured. So the, the updated measurement that was released last week, uh, RK comes out exactly the same central value as the previous measurement with a smaller uncertainty. So now it's gone down to about the 4% level or so. And the reason there was a bit of a fuss last week is because this uh, measurement crossed this statistical threshold. It crossed the, what we call the three sigma threshold, which means that the p-value is now about 0.1% or it's about you know, a one in a thousand uh, experiments you would expect to give a deviation this large. So it, it's now what we, in, in particle physics terms, this is what we call evidence. So this is now evidence for the violation of lepton universality. Um, um, this is sort of obviously not yet at the stage where you can say we've definitely seen something that will require a lot more data, but it's certainly interesting. Um, and it's generated a lot of interest in the theory community. Uh, another thing just to, I thought I'd worth mentioning is that the, I mentioned that the simulation that's used to calculate the efficiency is calibrated with data to make it improve, improve the agreement. One of the other things that gives a lot of confidence is you turn off that calibration. So you just use the simulation as it is without any corrections. It only changes the value of R by about 3%. So you can't explain, um, you know, this deviation just from some missed systematic, it seems. So th there's a lot of confidence this result is, is pretty robust. So of course, though, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And, and we've seen uh, three sigma effects come and go in the past. Um, a famous one going back to 2015 was when Atlas and CMS thought they might be seeing the effect of a new particle at high mass. So there's this famous photon bump in a, in a spectrum, a mass spectrum. This is the bump here that caused a lot of excitement. I think about 400 theory papers were written about this bump, but when more data was added, the, the bump disappeared um, and the particle was found, it unfortunately didn't exist. So we, we've seen things like this happen in the past. But there is a reason why theorists are cautiously optimistic this time around. The first one is that as time has passed and more data has been added, these anomalies have generally gotten stronger rather than faded, which is what you'd expect if they were a statistical fluke. Um, the second thing is these lepton universality ratios are very clean, free from theory uncertainties, as I said. The measurement itself is experimentally very robust against systematics because of this double ratio. And the, probably the most persuasive thing of all is that this anomaly is not alone. It, it's part of a co larger coherent picture, not just in these rare B decays, but also in, in some other processes. So, for example, these decays involving uh, B to D decays where you have a tau or a muon, this quantity called RD star, which is in a completely different sort of type of decay. But again, there's some tension with the standard model at about three sigma. Um, just uh, after, in the, in the aftermath of the conference last week, uh, that some theory papers have already appeared where theorists try to do these big fits, where they put in all the different measurements that have been made at LHCB and at other experiments and try to see what the tension with the standard model is. And if you combine all these measurements, you can claim up to six and a half sigma tension with the standard model, which is way above the, the threshold for claiming a discovery, although I think most experimenters be much more cautious than this. But nonetheless, this is one reason why people are taking these more seriously than some of the other three sigma effects that we've seen in, in the past. Um, so what could this be? Well, broadly speaking, there are two popular explanations for this effect, um, and they involve new, essentially new uh, gay, new bosons, new force particles of some kind, either something called a Z prime, 
which is a, a flavor changing interaction that could change a, a beauty quark into a strange quark or possibly something called a leptoquark, which is a particle with the properties of both leptons and quarks and can decay into leptons and quarks simultaneously. So it's possible that if these are really what's causing the anomalies, that these particles are within the reach of the LHC and Atlas and CMS have already been looking to see if they can find evidence of these particles being created directly in the collisions. Although, of course, they could also have masses above the reach of the LHC, in which case we'll need a, a future collider to look for them, if indeed they are really there. Um, and just to sort of say, the sort of the interesting thing about this is if, if these effects are borne out and there are indeed we are indeed seeing signs of new physics, it could well be connected to the flavor puzzle. This question of why there are six quarks and six leptons could be connected to the existence of these new particles if indeed they are there to be found. So it, it could be the start of something really quite exciting. Um, just to give you a bit of, just as I, before I finish, to say a bit about the future. So LHCB is currently undergoing a major upgrade, uh, which will begin running next year. And this will allow us essentially to increase the rate we record data by about a factor of five. So over the course of the next uh, sort of five to 10 years, we'll accumulate a much, much larger data set than we've had previously. And that will allow us to really measure these quantities much more precisely. And it should allow us to push these anomalies if they persist um, over the five sigma threshold where you can really claim um, an observation of, of new physics. So there's sort of exciting times ahead. Um, so as I said, there's no new parts of the LHC yet, but these rare decays are showing us probably the best signs that we've seen so far of new physics at the LHC. And they form this interesting coherent picture, which is why a lot of theorists are now taking them quite seriously. But of course, these are not yet at the threshold statistically where we can claim that we're really seeing something. And of course, you have to be humble and say there's always the possibility that you've missed a, a systematic effect that somehow, you know, um, uh, means that you're not you're not getting your efficiencies right, for example. But there are lots of more measurements that are being performed with the existing LHCB data. And I'm, I'm making some of these and a lot of my colleagues are as well. So there'll be more coming in fairly short order, I hope. Uh, and then the ultimate the LHCB upgrade will bring some great opportunities to hopefully finally discover deviations from the standard model. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Harry, for that fantastic talk.